Good morning. So glad to see you all here. Please stand as we begin our worship this morning. For those of you who know about our Monday school ministry, um, every Monday at 1030 uh, out at Stanford Place. And this is one of the residents' favorite songs. And when we get to the part where we sing, hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the king, those sweet people raise their hands. So we invite you this morning to worship with us soon and very soon. If you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, one day we're going to be in heaven with him. And there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more dying, no more of this disease, no more heartache, no more depression, no more of this stuff that you're dealing with all the time. We'll be in the presence of the King forever. It's going to be a glorious day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for giving us this opportunity to worship. And Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ your Son, and our Savior. Jesus, we worship you because you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. God, thank you that you love us, that you care for us, for every single person in this room, for all of our friends, for all of our families. God, you care for all the people of this world. And God, you care for each of us individually, personally, and God, it's so good to know you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would anoint our service, that you would change us, that you would do a mighty work, that you would fall in power on this place. And Holy Spirit, if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus personally, doesn't know that assurance, doesn't know that peace, doesn't know that comfort, doesn't know what salvation is, Holy Spirit, please draw them to Jesus, point them to him, and God, Help them to trust in you today. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I just want to share with you a couple things. Uh, number one, today is the last day to turn in uh, your, your vote for, for deacons. And so if you're a member of our church, you've received a ballot. And if you're not a member of our church, you need to become a member of our church so that you can help be a part of all these things as a member, okay? And so the, the ballot box is in the back. You can turn it in there. And to our deacons, we'll let you know soon um, the results of that. Also, you can see on our, our sign over here, Forward by Faith. You may be asking yourselves, what is that, Forward by Faith? You see down, you might be able to see at the very bottom, Worship Center Expansion and Renovation. God has placed a vision on our hearts to expand our worship center and, uh, and to renovate it. And so we've been in the process of that, and we're going to be bringing all that we have to you, the church, here in just a few weeks. And when we bring all that to you, we're going to lay out the plans and what it looks like and the cost and, and all of that. And I told you last week, and I want to remind you again, that we're going forward by faith. And 
The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that it's impossible to please God apart from faith. Now, here's what that means. You can't please God any way other than acting and living and believing by faith. You can do all kinds of things. But if it's not by faith, it doesn't please God. That's what the Bible says. That's not what I say. That's what the Bible says. And God shows us in Scripture that He is always faithful. And when we are obedient to Him, and when we act and live by faith, He always shows up and He does what He wants to do to bring Himself honor and glory. He always shows up. He always provides. So we've been asking you to give sacrificially to this initial goal of 100000 That's going to help us as we go through this process. In fact, we believe that we would like to, we would like to go into this with, with over $100,000. That's really going to help in the long run. Uh, we're about $15,000 away from reaching that initial goal of $100,000. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we reached that be even before in, se in several weeks when we bring this proposal to the church? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we've already reached that $100,000 goal? So I'm just going to encourage you, if you've given, pray and consider giving again. And if you've not given to Forward by Faith, listen, you need to get alone with God. And you need to ask Him to give you a passion and to give you a vision. And you need to step up and to give towards this as we're going to be unified as a church. And this is going to make a difference in our church and in this community for years and years and years to come. And let me just tell you this, church. I believe what we're doing is not the end. This is just one simple step of where God's taking us. I believe in the years to come, there's even going to be more. So, friends, you need to, we need to get on board right now. And we, need to get, we need to get in line with God. And then we need to begin to start expecting the great things that we know God can do as we're obedient to Him. I want to lead us in a moment of prayer. And I, I've asked you last week to pray. I want us to pray again. I believe in the power of prayer here in this church. Listen, on every Wednesday night, we are having what we call prayer meeting. And I mean legitimate prayer meeting. We're not just calling it prayer meeting. We're actually having prayer meeting on Wednesday nights at 6.30. We're seeing God do miraculous things through the prayer meeting. We're, we're seeing prayers answered. Okay? You need to be, I encourage you, come at 6.30 on Wednesday nights and be a part of that as we seek the face of God and we pray together. But I want us to all bow our heads right now. I'm going to ask you to begin praying. Just pray for our Forward by Faith initiative. Right now, right there where we're at, begin praying. Maybe you're here today. You, this is your first time here at our church. Maybe God's laying something else on your heart you need to pray about. That's okay. Begin praying about that thing. Whatever it is, just begin praying. Maybe you need to ask God to forgive you of sin, confess sin in your life. Just, just do that right now. It will enhance your worship today if you will do that. Pray and ask God that we would be obedient to him as a church as he leads us. Pray, ask God to do above and beyond according to his power in this church than we could ever imagine or dream. Pray that he would pr provide these resources supernaturally through us. Pray that he would give us wisdom and discernment. Maybe today you're struggling with something no one else in this room knows. Maybe not even your, your husband or your wife or your kids. No, maybe no one knows about it but you and God. Take this time right now. Pray about that thing. Pray about that. God will hear you right now. He will answer your prayer. Come to him by faith right now as you pray. Father, Lord, we're humble before you today. 
But God, you tell us in Hebrews that it's your desire for us to come boldly before your throne of grace and to pour our hearts out to you. So God, we come to you. We come to you showing you all of who we are. Lord, forgive us of our sin. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Holy Spirit, anoint this time together. Hear our prayers. Answer our prayers. We know you will. And God, do a mighty work in this service today. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. If you would, let's stand together. Let's stand together. And as you stand, our team's going to continue to lead us in song. Right. 
sitting in a church service. Preacher, my dad was the preacher, did what we do here. He went down front at the end and said, now's your opportunity to come and trust in Jesus. And I just remember having this sense that someone was speaking to my heart and drawing me. And it's, God was saying, go, go. And I stood up. My brother was sitting behind me I said, would you come with me? He's 14 years older than me. And he said, sure. And I walked up front. Just as we sing, I know what happened that day. Jesus touched me. Friend, has Jesus touched your life? I didn't hear anybody say amen. Are we alive today? Do you believe Jesus has come out of the grave? Has Jesus touched you and made you whole? He has me. And I'm going to shout it. And I'm going to praise him. And you know what? I want, us to, I want us to take the next few minutes. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. And, and I want us to see what Jesus teaches us about how he changes us. How he makes us whole. And how it is a matter of of life and death. John chapter 8. We have been in the gospel of John. We've been in chapter 8 for a number of weeks. Today we finish chapter 8. Next week we'll be in chapter 9. Now don't hold me to this. But I believe next week we will finish all of chapter 9 in one week. But you don't have to bring a lunch that day. Okay. I'll keep it to about 30 minutes. Don't be worried. Next week you don't want to miss it. Because we're going to look at this phenomenal account where Jesus touches and heals a blind man. And it's just, it's powerful, okay? But today, Jesus is going to teach us and talk to us about a matter of life and death. And over the course of the last 18 months, I believe death has been so very real to all of us. Because of what has been going on in the world, we have seen so much death. 
We have seen so many friends and so many families go through suffering for all various types of reasons. But Jesus has a word of hope for us. He tells us that you can experience a lie and never truly taste death. Or you can choose to not experience his life, and you will most definitely taste death. Today, what God's word tells us is that there is a decision that we must make, and it's a matter between life and death. Look at it with me, starting here in verse 51 of John chapter 8. If you are able, I'm going to ask you to stand if you're physically able. If not, that's okay. But if you're able, please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll have the text on the screen. And in verse 51, Jesus says, truly I tell you. Maybe your translation says truly, truly. The King James says verily, verily. This is an important phrase. Jesus is saying, truly, truly, get, I'm getting your attention. This is most definitely a fact you need to hear. You need to understand this. Truly, I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Now, that's the word of Christ. He says, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Then the Jews said, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. You say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. So the Jews are like, look, all these godly people that we look up to, Abraham, the prophets, Elijah, Moses, all these people, they all died. Jesus, you're just a lunatic. You're a fraud. You don't know what you're talking about. That's what the Jews are saying. Verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you claim to be? If I glorify myself, Jesus answered, my glory is nothing. My father, about whom you say he is our God, he is the one who glorifies me. You do not know him, but I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him. And I keep his word. Now look at this, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews replied, you aren't 50 years old yet. And you've seen Abraham who died a thousand or so years ago. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you. Before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden and he went out of the temple. And why was he hidden and he went out of the temple? Because his time had not yet come. Because friends, Jesus came on a mission to go to the cross on your behalf. And nothing would stop him or prevent him from dying on that cross and shedding his blood for you and for your sin. Father, we ask that you would honor the reading of your word and, and help us to understand, Holy Spirit, what it is you're teaching us. And God, we have come here today not to simply hear your word, but that your word would get roots deep into our hearts. God, that through your word and the power of the Holy Spirit, you would actually change us, make us different. God, lead us to salvation. Call us to surrender. Call us to make decisions for you, to be obedient to you. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This is a life and death situation. Jesus says truly, truly, life and death depends on this thing. Believing the word of God. Did you realize how important the word of God is? Here it is. Here's the word of God. Listen, I just want to encourage you. I hope you have the word of God. You need to have a hard copy of God's word. You need to have a digital copy of God's word. If you have a, an iPad or a, or a, a smartphone, 
You need to have that. You need to take seriously God's word. This is God's word. The Bible is. It's his complete word. It's his perfect word that he has given to us. And Jesus says, life and death depends on believing this word. His word. The word of Christ. The word of Jesus. The word of God tells us that Jesus saved. The Word of God tells us that we can trust in Jesus. The Word of God tells us that when we trust in Jesus by faith, that He truly will change us. He will change our lives. He will make us whole. And He does this in us by His grace as we respond to Him in faith and we are, and we are obedient to Him. When you study the Bible, that's what the Word of God teaches us and tells us. You may not know this, but the Word of God is all about Jesus. Let me say that again. If you're a new Christian, you might need to write that down so that it'll help you in studying your Bible. From Genesis to Revelation... All of the Bible is about Jesus Christ. There are 66 books in the Bible, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament. In every single book, every single page, every single story from Genesis, the first chapter, to Revelation, the last chapter, it is all completely about the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. If you read your Bible and you do not see Jesus, you need to read it again until you see him. Because I promise you, all of the Bible is about Jesus. God is the author himself. There were 40 human authors, but they were all, they all wrote as they were divinely inspired by the true author, the divine author, God himself. This is God's word about himself, about Jesus to you. The Old Testament tells us that Jesus, the Messiah, is coming. That's what the Old Testament is telling us. Genesis chapter 3. Adam has sinned. And the very first picture of Jesus comes into focus when it says that he will crush the head of the serpent. That there is one coming and he will defeat Satan. He will defeat the devil and he will give a death blow to his head. And all through the rest of the Old Testament, God is teaching us. He is telling us, I am sending my son. The Messiah is coming. Jesus is coming. He's going to be the Savior of the Jews. But not only the Jews, he's going to be the Savior of the whole world. And then you get to the Gospels. And what do the Gospels tell us? The Gospel tells us he's here. Jesus is here. He has come. Here is the Messiah. And you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's all about Jesus walking this earth, healing and teaching and performing miracles. And it all comes to that point there towards the end of the Gospels where the Messiah goes to the cross and he dies there for the sin of the world. He's buried in the grave. He's raised to life as he's resurrected from the dead on the third day. And he ascends to heaven. See, the Gospels tell us Jesus is here. God said he was coming and Jesus has come. And then through the rest of the New Testament, do you know what it's telling us? The rest of the New, Tele New Testament is telling us that Jesus is coming again. Friend, it's all about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. Friend, you need to get ready, all of us in this room today, because we are living in the age where Jesus has come and we are waiting for God to do exactly what he has promised, which is to send Jesus back here as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And friend, he's coming soon. Are you ready? That's what the Bible tells us. 
All the scripture is about Jesus. I don't have this for the screen. Flipping your Bible over to John chapter 5, though. Flipping your Bible to John chapter 5. I don't have it for the screen. I apologize. That, maybe that will just encourage you. Get a, get a Bible, okay? Look at what it says here. Jesus says this in John chapter 5. You pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them. And yet they testify about me. How is there salvation in the scriptures? There's only salvation in the scriptures because Jesus is in the scriptures. Jesus says, look, when you look at the scriptures, you need to understand the scriptures have been written, not for the scripture's sake, but it's been written for describing to you and showing you Jesus. That's what they're there for, to testify to you about the Son of God. Friend, I'm just here to tell you today. I'm here to tell you, this is a matter of life and death. Spiritual life, eternal life. There is a real heaven, there is a real hell. And if you've not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are spiritually bankrupt, you are spiritually dead, you are a dead man or woman walking. And when you take your last breath here on this earth, you're not taking a breath of life in heaven. You're going to continue to take breaths of death in hell forever. Jesus says, this is a matter of life and death. The only way that you can be saved, have your sins forgiven, have eternal life, experience God in a personal relationship, and one day go to heaven is if you trust in the Jesus of the scriptures. You can't just trust in any Jesus you want to trust in. You can't trust in just any Jesus some cult tells you about. Or some random person talks to you about. Or somebody on TV talks about. I got a letter in the mail this week. From the Jehovah's Witnesses asking me to watch some convention. Friend, if you trust in the Jesus that they try to tell you to trust in, you will not be saved. You must trust in the Jesus of the scriptures. The way scripture tells us and teaches us about Jesus. That is the only way and it is a matter of life and death. But the good news is this. You can trust in him. He has made himself known to you. He has given you his love letter. Friends, is it not remarkable? And is it not marvelous that God has given you and me the gift of having a hard copy of Scripture in our hands or on our cell phones? Is that not remarkable? And this is God's love letter to you telling you Jesus loves you and that you can trust in him for salvation and have your sins forgiven. Jesus says, in verse 56, the Jews had been just mocking and ridiculing Jesus. I mean, think about this. Jesus has no darkness. Jesus has no evil in him whatsoever. Jesus is truth and truth only. And yet they say, Jesus, you're demonic. They mock and they ridicule him. Let me just say something to my brothers and sisters in here that have trusted in Jesus. If they persecuted, mocked, and ridiculed Jesus, you need to understand they will mock, ridicule, and make fun of you if you're a Christian. Jesus says this in John, throughout John. And so don't be surprised if you don't go through difficulties and persecutions in this world because you are a Christian. Because, friend, a servant is not greater than his master, and Jesus is our master. And if they persecuted Jesus, if they made fun of him, 
if his family and his friends and his associates and the people around him, if they mocked and ridiculed and made fun of him, it should not surprise you that this world around us would mock and ridicule you and me for being Christians. Just this week, I was surfing the channels one evening on TV, and I slipped up on this vulgar person on cable TV trying to be a comedian and simply making fun of Christians just on cable TV. Had John 3.16 spray painted on a car and was making fun of Christians and all this stuff. Friends, I'm just telling you. The world is going to be against you. Your boss may be against you. Your family may be against you. Your friends may be against you. But if God is for you, there's nothing you have to worry about. In Romans it says, if God is for you, who can be against you? Because God has not even spared his very own son for you. And if God has given you Jesus, what more does he need to give you? He's already given you everything. Now, in verse 56, after they make fun and ridicule Jesus, and they talk about Abraham. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham, Abraham was the forefather of the faith, the forefather of the nation of Israel. And Jesus says, Abraham saw Christ's day and he rejoiced when he saw it. See, God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. In fact, I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. And I'm gonna, we're going to stay in Genesis here for a moment. Because I want to walk through something with you. In Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham and he said, Abraham, I'm going to bless the world through you and through your descendants. I'm going to give you a son and you are going to become a great nation the stars of the sky, as innumerable as they are, that's how great your family is going to be. He said, God said, Abraham, now, I've been telling you God calls us to operate by faith. You know what God told Abraham to do? God said, Abraham, I'm sending you somewhere, but I'm not telling you where. You just start walking. Now, what if God told you that today? What if God told a church today, hey, church, I got something I'm going to do for you. You step out and do this. I'm not going to tell you what the end looks like. You're just going to have to trust me with it. Would you be willing to step out like Abraham did? He did. He went to a land he did not know. He left his family. He left his friends. He left all he knew simply because God said, step out and go. And he says, I'm going to give you these descendants. And I'm going to bless the whole world through you, Abraham. And through your seed, Abraham, I'm going to bless the whole world. And God is saying, I'm going to ultimately bless this world through you, Abraham, because through your descendants, I'm going to send the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And in Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham was 75 years old, God made this promise to him through the birth of a son. If you'll flip over to Genesis chapter 21, a lot happens in between this. But 25 years have passed, and Abraham doesn't have a son yet. He was 75, now he's 99. And Abraham and Sarah, Sarah's barren, she can't have kids. And they said, what are we going to do? God comes and visits again, he says, I'm not, I'm not giving up on you, Abraham. I've made a promise to you. You just be patient and wait. One year from now, you're going to have a son. You're going to have a child. And now at 100 years old and Sarah at 90, they have conceived and they have, now Sarah has given birth to Abraham's son of his seed. And this in itself is a miracle of God. And God fulfilled his promise and he gave Abraham and Sarah a son named Isaac. He had to wait till he was 100 years old, 25 years after hearing the promise of God. 
God says, just keep having faith, though. It's my timing. You trust me. Then God does something that just sends shockwaves throughout all the world. Genesis 22, look at it. After these things, verse 1, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. It's kind of getting hot in here. Y'all mind? Oh, no, I'm hung up. Plus, I have to take that off anyways because we're doing a baptism at the end of the service. For 25 years, he's waited for a son. God's given him. Now Isaac's a young man, probably a young teenage boy. And God says, Abraham, this is what I require of you. You take your son, your only son, the one that you love, you take him up to this mountain, the Mount Moriah, and there I want you to place him down upon the altar, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. It says here, in verse 3, So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father. And he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? I mean, here's poor Isaac. And he is the offering. And he himself is carrying the wood that will burn him up on his very own shoulders up to the mountain of sacrifice. And he's doing this with this father that he loves. They're walking together. How would you like to be Abraham that day when his son looks over at him and says, something's missing here, dad. Because we always take a lamb when we're going to give this offering. What's going on? And the Abraham is gripped. And he's heartbroken. He doesn't know what it is he can say because he knows God has said that Isaac would be that sacrifice. He looks over there at his son. And Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together, all Abraham could grab a hold of was the goodness, the faithfulness, the promises of God. The Bible tells us later that Abraham believed that even God could raise his son from the dead. Abraham was going on that mountain to be obedient to God. He didn't know how God would provide. He thought it may be that he just raised Isaac from the dead. But Abraham believed God would provide. And he had faith. And he was being obedient to God. Even in this most difficult task. It says in verse 9. When they arrived at the place. That God had told him about. Abraham built the altar there. And arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac. And he placed him on the altar. On top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out. He took the knife. 
to slaughter his son. There he is, Isaac. He's laid up on the wood. Abraham has the knife to slaughter him. He's reaching back, ready to do what God has called him to do with tears pouring out his eyes as he looks down at his son and tears coming from Isaac's eyes. And there he is as sweat is dripping off of him and he raises the knife and here he comes to do it. And right then in verse 11, God says, wait, wait. The Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Friends. When was it that Abraham saw Jesus and rejoiced? I'm going to tell you when. It was right then. There he was, looking down at the altar, looking down at his only son, the son that he loved. He was about to be given as a sacrifice to God. And as he looked down upon Isaac and God said, wait, Abraham saw Jesus. Because see, Isaac's a picture for us of Jesus. Isaac's one of those Old Testament stories that point to us about the ultimate sacrifice that would come and that would be given. Jesus Christ. Abraham then saw that ram after God told him not to do it. God provided that ram. Listen, as Abraham and Isaac were walking up one side of the mountain, God had his provision walking up the other side of the mountain, and God had that ram get caught in a thicket. And Abraham went and got that provision. He brought it over, and he offered that blood sacrifice and worship of God. And in, and in verse 14, Abraham, it says, name that place, the Lord will provide. And that's where we get the word, the name of God, Jehovah Jireh. Oh, there's a popular song many of you like. I, I like it. It's called Jireh. You enjoy listening to that song. Well, I'll tell you what that song's about. It's about this. It's about the fact that. The Lord will provide. The name means literally Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. God is a provider. God keeps and fulfills his promises. God is faithful. God will provide. Provide, Friend, there is no doubt about it in here today that you and I, we go through and we will go through trials. The days are difficult. We will go through many difficulties. We are going to be tested. We are going to be tried. It is going to be difficult. It's going to seem uncertain. We're not going to know exactly how things are going to turn out. It might look as difficult as it looked for Abraham that day. You're going to go through times of tears, of heartbreak, of brokenness, of confusion. But if you've believed in Jesus, you can like Abraham say, I look ahead and I know Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Some of you are going through a difficulty right now. You're going through a struggle. And you're wondering exactly what this is going to turn out for you. I don't have the answer for you. But I can tell you this. The Lord will provide according to his goodness. And according to his will. And you can always trust in the Lord's provision. In fact... I want you to know today that God has already given you his ultimate provision. 
the provision you need more than anything else. The ultimate provision is Jesus Christ. See, God told Abraham to stop. Because the blood of Isaac couldn't save a single person on this earth. The blood of Abraham couldn't save a single person on this earth. The blood of Moses couldn't save a single person on this earth. The blood of Elijah and Elisha couldn't save a single person on this earth. The blood of Peter couldn't save a person. The blood of Paul couldn't save a person. The blood of John couldn't save a person. Only the precious and the perfect blood of Jesus Christ can save a person. And his blood is powerful and is sufficient to save the whole world if you will trust and place your faith in him. So God said, don't shed Isaac's blood. He said, I just want you to see that my provision is coming. A couple thousand years later, God did send his provision. And the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. See, the provision you need and I need more than anything else is the forgiveness of sin. We need the blood of Jesus applied to our lives. We need to be washed clean. We need to be brought into a right relationship with God. We need to become spiritually alive. Friends, it's a matter of life and death. Believing in Jesus Christ. I want to share with you something else that's interesting. This word, Jehovah Jireh, that word Jireh, the root of that word means to see. To see. Vision, provision, to see. To see. Now, if you'll go back to John, Jesus said, Your father Abraham. Rejoice to see my day. The Jews replied, you are 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. This is one of the most powerful statements in the Gospel of John that is written. We have seven sign miracles. They're signs because Jesus performed them and John wrote about them in a way that helps us see that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is deity Himself. He is not a God, He is the God. That he is the second person of the Trinity. He is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. Here is Jesus Christ. John also gives us seven I am statements. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the light of the world. Jesus has all these I am statements. And this one, we don't put in that category of the seven because there's not a metaphor that goes along with it. It's not like Jesus here says, I am the light of the world with a metaphor. Jesus just simply says, friends, you look back to your forefather Abraham. You think about his greatness. You think about how you study him. He says, before Abraham ever even existed, before I called him and made these promises to him, before the foundation of the world, Jesus says, I am. Because see, Jesus is the self-existent one. God is the eternal one. He's the one who was and is, and he is the one who is to come. See, friends, Jesus is the great I am. You can trust in Jesus. You can trust in his word. You can trust in his promise. You can trust in his provision. You can trust in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. You can trust in him because he is the I am. He is the son of God. He is the savior of the world. And there is none 
other. Friends, this is a matter of life and death. Jesus says, you can trust me. You can trust my word. You can believe in me and your life can be changed and you can never taste death because you will taste only eternal life if you will receive Jesus into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. You may be asking, how do I do that? Because you realize right now you need to do it. You need to do it. If you're here today, you've never trusted in Jesus, the Jesus of the scriptures. You've never test, trusted in who he is and what he has done. You need to do it today. Here's what the Bible says. Come to him by faith and repentance. That's what the Bible says. You come to Jesus the best you know how. Broken and humble. And you say, Jesus, I come to you. I repent of my sin and I trust fully in you. And if you will do that today, friends, you will go from death to life. And you will experience salvation in Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for giving us your son and giving us your word. Jesus, you alone save. And you came to this earth as our ultimate provision. Jesus We praise you in Jesus. May your blood powerfully change lives today. Holy Spirit, we know the blood of Jesus will do that today for anyone that trusts in him. We ask you, Holy Spirit, right now to draw men and women, boys and girls, adults, children, you senior adults, whatever the age, God, Holy Spirit, we ask you to draw them and have them here in a moment step out from their, from their row where they are, have been seated and walk forward to the front to just say, this is the best I know how to trust in Jesus. Give them that life that only you can give. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand to your feet. This is a time for you to respond to this message that God has given us. If you have never trusted in Jesus, I'm going to ask you right now as David begins to lead us and we begin to sing, I'm going to ask you to just wherever you're at, you might need to grab somebody, bring somebody with you, whatever. Don't be ashamed. We're all friends in this place. Friend, don't be ashamed of Jesus. You can come forward. I came forward up front. Many people in this room, they came forward up front at some point to say, I trust in Jesus. Don't be ashamed. You come. If you're unsure, if you're doubting, if you're like, I'm just not sure, come. Get sure today. You can get sure if you'll come today. Maybe you know today that you need to be baptized here one day soon to follow God and believers' baptism. Come forward and tell me. Say, I want to be baptized one day soon. We'll work that out. Maybe you know God's leading you to become a part of this church Come forward and say, we'd like to be a part of this. I'll help you with that. Maybe today, you just need to pray. This altar's open. These seats on the front row, they're open. If you want to come to them and sit and pray, please come right now as David leads us. Please come. Don't wait. Come. Come. I'm here. To follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Afraid of what other people might think. Only be worried about what God thinks. And I'm telling you, the people in this room, they're not going to think poorly of you. They're going to be excited for you. And they're going to pray for you. And we're going to encourage you if you'll just come now. Come now. 
the cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. No turning back. in him today for salvation and you want to let me know that you need to do that I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out or make you come up front or anything like that I'll just lead you in a prayer that you can pray privately that right there in your seat between you me and God if you need that today only I'm looking around and God sees all things would you lift your hand right now I'll lead you in a prayer if you need that lift it high so that I can see it if you've never trusted in Jesus and you want to do that, just lift it high so that I can see that. Father God, you've been so good to us today. You're always good. God, we thank you for providing for us, Jesus. Yes, thank you for your hand. I see it. Any other hands? A hand has come up. Any other hands? If you've never trusted in him before, or it wasn't real when you did it before, Father, thank you for this work you're doing today. For, the, for you that raise your hand, I'm just going to say a prayer right now. You can say this in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud. If you just want to Pray this prayer and trust in Jesus. If you mean it, I believe you'll be saved. Just repeat this after me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. But I know that you came to provide salvation for me. Jesus, I trust in you. In your death on the cross, your burial, and in your resurrection. Jesus, come into my life, change me, and save me. Lord, I repent of my sin, and it's my desire to now live for you in all areas of my life. Holy Spirit, help me to do that. Help me to not be ashamed of this decision. Help me to take the steps after this that I need to take. Jesus, thank you for saving me, and I love you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As you're seated, I just want you to know if you pray today to receive Jesus, if you raise your hand, I know if you are, I'm going to follow up with you. If you did not raise your hand or you did not come forward and you need to talk to me about a, about a decision, then I encourage you to find me after the service and tell me. All right. Now we're going to have a baptism. And I'm going to ask 
Abigail to come up here and stand with me. This is Abigail Moore. Abigail, I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the last several months and was able to do the wedding ceremony for Austin and Abigail. They had a beautiful wedding, a beautiful ceremony. And over the last couple months, Austin and Abigail have been coming faithfully here to church. They've gotten involved in um, Sunday school. They've been here faithfully in worship. And God's just been working powerfully in their lives. God's been working powerfully in Abigail's life. And several weeks ago, she came up to me and said, I want to be baptized in believer's baptism. That I want to be baptized and get my baptism on the right side of my salvation. She said, I haven't been baptized after I have been saved. But I believe this is what the Word of God teaches, and that's what I want to do. And so we celebrate that with you, Abigail. And I'm going to ask you if you would go ahead and get into the baptistry. Abigail, have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Abigail, upon your profession of faith of Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen, amen. Austin, I'm gonna have, would you come up here, Austin? Now, Austin and Abigail, they're gonna, they'll be standing up here at the end of the service. We're about to dismiss. I want you to just come by and celebrate with them uh, Abigail's decision. Also, Austin comes today to join our church, and so they come together to join, and Abigail to be baptized. And so can we stand together, and can we give glory to God? Can we praise God today? Come on. I mean, act like somebody scored a touchdown. Let's go now. Come on. Amen. David, come up here. Would you dismiss us in prayer? David's going to dismiss us in prayer, and then I want you to come by and see them, okay? God, how we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you so much for how you're working in our church, Lord. I pray that we would share the great news of your salvation with those around us, Lord. Just bless every person here today. Help them through this week, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.